Hey guys, uh, we are here uh, with IPFS. Uh, Molly is the IPFS project lead and she'll be doing a talk around DeFi dApps on IPFS and I'll let her take it from here. Hello everyone, excited to chat with you all today. Um, first, I'm gonna give you guys a little uh, intro to IPFS since maybe not everyone here is familiar and then we're gonna dive deeper into actually how you build uh, the front end for a DeFi dApp on IPFS. So it seems the chat broke. <laughs> So people can ask questions and interact via the ask a question section. And if you guys can just confirm that you can hear us, that'd be great. Thank you. Do you see where the questions are? Ask a question. I do. Okay, perfect. So you can get started. They confirmed. Thank you, guys. Cool. Um, so IPFS is designed to make the web work peer to peer. So it takes the model. The, the internet, the web we know today from a centralized HTTP model where many nodes all connect to a central server in order to get data and instead allows a much more flexible orientation where nodes can connect directly to each other to exchange data. And it does this by using content addressing. So instead of addressing data by where it's located in the network or what entity is hosting it, like you know, facebook.com, um, instead it loads data based on what it is. It's a cryptographic hash. Um, which let's take take a um, a reference to say baz.png, which you know example.com here can constantly change and update what baz.png means, and you have no way of knowing if the data you're getting is the data you meant to get. Instead, it addresses data by its content address, which means you can always verify that the data that you're fetching is what you intended to grab. IPFS aims to address a ton of different problems. Um, some notable ones are censorship. So instead of having a single central entity that has the, the control over what data you're loading and can therefore be um, you know, subject to author authoritarian control, um, it, it enables many parties in the network to all uh, maintain and host a service. Um, it's more efficient instead of having to go to that central party, no matter whether you already have the data right next to you um, or your neighbor has it or, or cached on another device you own, you can be much more flexible about the model through which you get data, which can help you know, be much more efficient in the distribution of content. Um, and that resiliency also helps mitigate faults and errors in the network. So it, say if you're offline, you can still collaborate and use the tools and applications you care about. The IPFS ecosystem is large and thriving across a ton of different verticals. Um, this is just a small subset of the uh, various applications that are building on top of IPFS in a number of different verticals. So you have um, content-oriented things, video, um, music, various other tools like that. Um, you have more productivity or chat-based tools, um, identity, data, social media, marketplaces, a ton of different projects are building in the IPFS ecosystem um, and, and working together to, to um, share content and collaborate. Most recently, um, as of last Tuesday, we actually released a new version of IPFS, IPFS 0.5, halfway there. Um, and this is really exciting. A lot of um, big major improvements went in here, especially around performance and efficiency. And so I'm actually gonna drop the link to that in the chat, which may or may not be working, but if it is, please do go check that out. There's some, some cool upgrades. If you're running IPFS, help us make the network better by, by upgrading quickly. And if you're not, it'd be a cool, a cool time to check out and see what's new. All right, so the meat of this talk, especially for this audience, is thinking about how IPFS is relevant to the DeFi space. Um, so starting first, what is a DeFi dApp? Um, these are uh, open source tools that help improve the current financial system by intermediating middlemen and centralized controllers using decentralization. Um, they're a subset of dApps in general, um, which generally run on peer-to-peer -peer networks of computers and avoid any sort of central service or sole controller or maintainer of the network. Um, main benefit is that you don't, uh, you're, you're no longer subject to that central party's control. Um, so thinking specifically for a DeFi dApp, um, two important properties that, that um, need to be met here. One, anyone can run a DeFi dApp. It's permissionless. Any interested party can spin up a node and participate. And no sole entity controls or operates the service, um, which means that you want a distributed network of peer nodes that are all responsible for hosting or approving transactions or helping make that service exist. Um, 
So what is a DeFi app? Really, there's two major components here. There's the static web app front end that can be hosted on something like IPFS and distributed over a, a peer to peer network and a smart contract based back end hosted on something, a blockchain like Ethereum. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the static web app front end, since most of the other people at this conference are talking much more about the, the back end side of things. Um, I'll, I'll focus specifically on the IPFS front end component. Um, so tons of applications are already using IPFS um, for, for their DeFi distributed front ends. Um, a small subset includes folks like Kyber.crypto, which put their front end up on, on IPFS, um, MyEtherWallet.crypto, DiffusionDex, BlockTimer.dapstar.eth, Coinomi.crypto, uh, and uh, the many different variants of Uniswap Exchange uh, that are all, all up on IPFS as um, static front ends that can be distributed fully peer to peer. Um, so how does one actually go through deploying a DeFi DAP front end on IPFS? So there's three major steps. First, you want to add your static web app front end to IPFS. And there's actually a lot of different tools that um, have, have come into the network, e even quite recently. A number of these are really only emerging in like the Q1 timeframe um, that allow you to very easily put up a static web app on IPFS. Um, next, you want to be able to load the DAP via some IPFS gateway, either an HTTP gateway or a local gateway that you run on your own node. Um, and finally, you want to be able to point a decentralized domain towards your content to make it really easy for others to find and reference and, and access that information. So starting with the first one, adding your static web app to IPFS. Um, Fleek is a new uh, application that has come into the space. It's actually all built on IPFS as well, um, but it allows you to very, very easily get started deploying a, a static front end to IPFS. Um, you can connect it directly to um, kind of a, an existing GitHub repo. It works with um, things like Hugo and uh, other you know, general static site um, frameworks. And it's very seamless to just quickly get up and running. And with a few clicks of buttons, boom, you have your static web app deployed on IPFS. Um, so definitely easiest, like five minutes and you're up in there um, if you already have all of the, um, the information in GitHub. So effectively replaces Netlify, um, but works on top of IPFS instead. Um, another example of a way to, to get up and running is to use IPFS desktop or the IPFS web UI. Um, once you have your own local node running, you can very easily add files and get that um, pinned to IPFS so that anyone can, can find and access it. Two other examples that have come in recently, um, the ENS um, domain manager now lets you upload files and folders directly to IPFS, um, which you can then address with your, your ETH link, your, your ETH name. Um, similarly, .crypto Unstoppable Domains also allows you to do this, and they have built-in templates and drag and drop upload. So very easy to get started getting your static site on top of IPFS easily. Uh, oh, gotcha. I can toggle my video off. Bigger? Better? Wonderful. Um, all right. So presuming all of that, we have got our static web app added to IPFS using one of these easy tools. Um, now you want to actually load the data. So two main choices. You can either use the IPFS HTTP gateway, which um, <clears throat> there's a number of these about. You can check the public gateway checker, and this will tell you different um, information and ping time to all of these different gateways. Lots of different um, groups and institutions run them. Um, an example is Cloudflare. I think as of end of 2018, they deployed a distributed web gateway for IPFS. Um, and so you can load data from the IPFS network through one of those HTTP gateways. Um, we also, the IPFS core team runs an HTTP gateway, um, which is getting it's, it's grown a good chunk just in the past six months. It's now getting 13 million requests a day, accessing about five terabytes of data. Um, and so that's one major way for, for your website to bridge and gain access and adoption in the, um, for, for users who are accessing it over the normal web today um, in web two. The other option is to actually load it over your local HTTP gateway. So if you're running a local IPFS node, say through something like IPFS desktop, which is a handy little tool that, that we built to make it really easy for folks to, to run and introspect onto a local IPFS node, um, this will uh, directly on your local machine allow you to connect to other nodes in the IPFS network and fetch content that way. 
uh, we've actually seen a lot of a growth and proliferation there as well, about a 30x increase last year in the size of the public network. And we now have hundreds of thousands of nodes all participating and connecting with each other, which allows them to you know, share, share data and fetch this data back and forth. All right, so now we've added our static front end to IPFS. We're able to load it via either an HTTP or local IPFS gateway. And now we want to actually point to something that's semi-human readable or um, you know, actually resolve uh, the, the links to IPFS in, um, in kind of a decentralized way. So uh, most, most notably and exciting, um, recently, about a month ago or so, Opera for Android added default built-in support for IPFS. So now you can directly reference um, IPFS colon slash slash or IPNS or other links um, directly in the Opera browser. Um, so more to come in our, in our upgrade path, but that's a awesome first step in terms of um, having really built-in support into the browsers that everyone is using that um, allows people to, to resolve uh, in a decentralized way, the content in Web3. We've also built a handy tool called IPFS Companion, which is uh, a great way for people to um, either you know, directly load content from a local IPFS node that's running um, or just translate to a gateway. And so it's a, it's a useful way to um, kind of bring more of that Web3 tooling to folks that are running in normal web browsers today say Chrome or Firefox, or actually this is the IPFS companion in extension is default embedded in Brave. So you can, <clears throat> with one click, enable the IPFS companion extension and then run even an embedded JS IPFS node. So you can, it's possible to have an embedded JS node running entirely within your browser. Uh, another awesome piece of tooling that we worked on with the Ethereum name service back, uh, I guess last, last June um, was this, uh, this new tool called ETHDNS, which is what enables you to do .eth.link uh, URLs and load, it, load um, Ethereum sites without any special configuration. So say if you don't have MetaMask installed or you don't have IPFS Companion, um, any user anywhere on the web um, can just append .link to any .eth uh, TLD, and that allows you to load it seamlessly using DNS. Um, and so that's, again, the, the sort of tooling that helps cross the chasm and bridge to folks who have not already come to the Web3 space and decided that they want to participate. Um, and, and the importance of that tooling is that it extends the reach for all developers who are building in this space and makes it much more accessible for them to find the users that want to, you know, say, browse their website or something along those lines. Um, another similar piece of tooling, the Unstoppable extension, um, it also has a ton of that functionality. It allows you to resolve to a, an HTTP gateway and, or a local gateway if you're running a local node. Um, and it also does the resolution of like .crypto or .zil TLDs. All right, so now you've added your static, static web app to IPFS, you've loaded your DAP via the gateway, um, and you have a decentralized way to point, um, point domains to the content you care about. Uh, this is all part of an upgrade path. So when you think about the tooling that we're creating here and how we're, we're working to enable the ecosystem, we need to bridge from all of the people who are coming, you know, just like Web2 worked with, with Web0, Web3 to, to make all of these applications accessible. Uh, we need to be working to bridge users from the read-write web into the read-write trust web. Um, and that means building the, the tooling and the, the bridges that people can, can cross on and demonstrate that Web3 has a lot of services and, um, and applications that actually deliver them real benefit. Um, and so all of the tooling that's being built here and the new UX that really reaches people's existing experience and, and desires for what the web should look like um, is, is really part of our upgrade path here. Uh, and something that as more people invest in it and building the, the nice UX or the infrastructure or the next layers of functionality, um, the easier it is for the entire space to grow and improve. So thank you so much. And I'm excited to take any of your questions. Hopefully this was a nice lightning tour of all of the ways you can build your DAP on IPFS. Someone was gonna ask something about Brave. All right, guys. So to ask questions, uh, bottom uh, left, ask a question. Do you wanna just hop into a common question that you normally get around Brave? 
while we wait for people to ask questions? Sure thing. Let me figure out how to toggle my video back on so people can see my face. All right. Cool. Um, common question about Brave, um, probably first is like, how does it work? <laughs> where, where do you, what do you do? How do I get my, um, my local IPFS node working on Brave? And you kind of have two main options there. Um, first things first, go to the extensions area of Brave. I think it's similar as in Chrome, colon slash slash extensions. Um, and from there, there's a one click, you know, enable IPFS uh, toggle, and that will um, dynamically detect whether you're running a local node. And so if you're running something like IPFS desktop, then um, you will automatically be able to fetch, say, go to the IPFS.io website or go to ethereum.eth.link or any of those sorts of um, websites that are all IPFS enabled, and it'll load it directly over your local IPFS node. Um, or you can, there's an experimental option within the extension settings where you can, instead of using a local IPFS node, so one that you're running locally on your machine, you can say run an embedded JS IPFS node. So if you don't have um, IPFS desktop, you can enable that setting and it'll instead spin up in JavaScript an IPFS node that can load content from the, the public network in that way. Um, so common, common question, uh, but if you have a more specific one, I'm happy to answer it. So there is another question, which is, how can you make IPFS faster when it is not nearby or commonly accessed? Uh, so basically performance. Um, there's a definitely, so there's, there's so many questions about performance. I'm not quite certain what this one in particular is asking about, um, but I can talk to you a little bit about the improvements we made in the most recent release in 0 0.5. Um, some of the major performance improvements there were um, one, looking at all of the nodes joining the network. We have hundreds of thousands of nodes. Some of those are browser nodes, some of those are mobile nodes. A lot of those nodes are on local, um, you know, just individuals in their houses that might be behind NATs and firewalls. Um, and so one important step in this release was uh, doing a kind of pruning where each node looks at their own connectivity and makes a judgment about whether or not they're gonna be a good participant in our DHT, which is how um, distributed hash tables, how everyone in the IPFS network routes requests for content. Um, and so previously everyone participated in the DHT and you had to manually configure yourself if you wanted to say, just be a client of the DHT and not actually participate in routing traffic. And now we do um, kind of a more dynamic assessment of, am I gonna be a good participant in routing people, other people's requests and traffic? And if you're say behind a firewall and you won't be able to do that effectively, um, you don't take on that additional uh, task, which helps make the network a lot faster because instead of um, trying to dial a number of nodes, which you're not gonna be able to connect to, um, you're gonna be much more efficient in your query and how quickly you can go and find the data you're looking for. So that's one example of, of a way in which we've improved the find time within IPFS. Um, another area of improvement was we uh, we worked closely with um, with groups who wanted to fetch content very quickly peer to peer. So an example here is the work we did with Netflix back in um, kind of August, I guess August through October timeframe, um, where they had a container distribution challenge that they wanted to make much more efficient by using peer to peer data transfer. And uh, we worked with them to actually measure, benchmark, and improve our peer-to-peer -peer data transfer algorithm called BitSwap um, in order to make it so that as you're you know, spinning up a new machine to do uh, as part of your build process, your CI/CD, you can um, very quickly fetch the exact pieces, uh, the exact blocks of data that are needed in order to do that um, from all other nodes in the network. And so um, kind of the, the, the concept of IPFS where like all nodes can directly send data to each other, you don't have to use some sort of central um, you know, registry in order to fetch that, um, help make things a lot more efficient. And we have a, a blog post I can drop in the chat about that if other people want to learn more with lots of graphs. Everyone loves graphs. Awesome. Uh, so next question, uh, what is the relationship between IPFS, Filecoin, and Protocol Labs? Um, so IPFS is an open source project. Um, it was initially I think it was actually created before Protocol Labs existed as a company um, by Juan Bonnet. Um, and it's now grown to be over 4,000 
open source contributors across a whole ton of different companies and, and organizations. Um, and Protocol Labs is an organization that funds a number of people who contribute to IPFS, but also a lot of other open source projects as well. So there's people who, who work on libp2p, people who work on SourceCred, which is a very cool um, kind of uh, identifying how to how to do value distribution and kind of reward people for contrib contributions to open source projects um, and a number of other research projects as well. Um, and so a number of people who work on IPFS are funded by um, Protocol Labs, but a very small number of the 4,000 open source contributors. And, uh, and then Filecoin is another project that was initially created by Protocol Labs, but also has a number of groups participating in it. And, it, and Filecoin aims to be an incentive mechanism for people to store data long-term in the IPFS network. So right now there's a number of groups who say run pinning services or um, otherwise participate by storing other people's data. So there's things like uh, collaborative clusters or other community ways of kind of incentivizing other groups to store public good data. Um, but you know, if you want a fully distributed storage mechanism, then using something like Filecoin, where there's a marketplace of people buying and selling storage, um, is a is a great way to get long-term persistence of data in IPFS. Um, and so that's kind of the the problem that they're aiming to solve. Very cool. So I actually have a question for you. So I've actually never heard Web3 described as read, write, and trust uh, web, but it's actually a perfect definition for it. Did you guys come up with that or is it? I'm definitely stealing this from a talk that Juan did at, um, I think it was Web3 2018 in Berlin um, called What is Web3? I think that's what it was. And so I'm, I'm stealing his definition from there and his ah. slide. So thank you Juan, ah. for letting me steal your slide. Um, Got it. But it's, so, a, it's a great example. Cool. So you mentioned for Web3 and Web2, like to you guys need to actually bridge it and get more people from Web2 into Web3. What have you seen in terms of like some success stories in terms of how people are able to migrate people into Web3? Yeah. I mean, I think Fleek is an amazing success story um, where, you know, they were able to see the benefit of using some, you know, uh, adapting the UI to make it very familiar and intuitive for anyone who's used to using Netlify or um, deploying a static site today using, you know, Hugo or ViewPress or something along those lines. And to just really quickly get up and running with the kind of the frameworks you expect and are used to using, but that you're able to just deploy to the D-Web and, and get kind of that pervasive, that, that sense of, um, coming into this space doesn't require knowing all of the internals and like taking courses in distributed systems. You can just use tooling that feels familiar to you. I think that's an amazing success story. I think they had thousands of people signed up within like the first month. So that's the, and, and by signed up, I mean like actually having gone through the process of deploying their own website to the D-Web, which is amazing. Um, so I think that's a really cool exemplar of the sorts of tools and applications that are possible to build now. Because like a year ago, that would have been still quite hard. Like the infrastructure, the um, the tooling to make that possible, that that level of like polished UX was still kind of landing. But I think, um, you know, we're getting to a state with the infrastructure that's been built up in the Web3 space that new, like very seamless tools like that, that bridge people's expectations of how to work with the web are getting more and more possible. Um, and so that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, that's amazing. So in terms of people and their expectations, when you talk to companies in Web2 or developers in Web2, like what are some common um, things you've heard regarding like why they should actually use IPFS or like what convinces them to actually migrate <laughs> into Web3? Great question. The things that I've heard the most are um, like they want to understand clearly what the benefit is. It, I know there's a lot of us in this Web3 community who are doing it because we're, you know, like we're aligned around a mission that this is the way the web should work. And and we, we do, you know, decentralization for the sake of decentralization speaks to a lot of people in this community. Um, but when you talk to, to Web2 companies or large organizations, they want to understand what is the problem this is solving. And so that's, you know, what is the efficiency? What's the cost? What's the, um, the, the data? Like, 
where's my benefit from like a bottom line business perspective? And so working with organizations like Netflix, where you can clearly see, great, how many hours of, of developer time would it save to use IPFS versus using, you know, Titus or Docker Hub, um, or working with an organization to think about, great, how much data am I storing? How much how much less data do I have to store if I can do content-based deduplication like I can with, with IPFS? Um, or how much more efficient would it be for me to seed data and have the whole network be able to distribute it more resiliently and, and more peer to peer? Um, you know, again, the, getting to those bottom lines of, of where they get the real benefit. And, and that's, that's really having the testing, it's having the metrics, which I think is something that's still, it's more nascent than I wish it were in the Web3 space, building up the tooling that demonstrates this is what the game looks like. Um, yes, it's reliable. Here are all the test cases where you can see that benefit. Here are the graphs that, that show you what the cost differential will look like. Um, and then building up that reliability as a service as well that, you know, it, you know, great, there might be a performance improvement, but if, you know, the network's falling over every other minute, then that's not that exciting for a group. And so also building up that reliability and stability as a service. Um, so we, we built a lot of tooling actually as part of doing this recent release to um, both be able to demonstrate the performance gains we were having and be much more reliable about network performance and resiliency. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So if people actually want to contribute to IPFS, what's the best place for them to go? We always love working with new contributors. Um, probably the best place to start um, would be there's an IPFS help page, which has a lot of great links. So if you just go to IPFS.io slash help, um, that's a great place to get started. There's a lot of help wanted issues on GitHub. Um, and so you, depending on whether you're a JS developer or a Go IPFS developer or a Rust developer, there is now a Rust IPFS implementation. Um, you can get started on some of those help wanted issues. And I, I think the tag in every repo is always just help wanted. It's a big, big green, button on any issue that wants some help. So that's a great place to go and um, and start contributing. Um, we have a discuss forum, discuss.ipfs.io. And that's a, a great place to talk to people who are excited about projects and maybe looking for other people to help them out or uh, exchange ideas about something they're passionate about. Um, and then finally, I'd point folks to, we have a new dev grants program. Um, so both libp2p and IPFS and Filecoin actually all have dev grants programs. So if you're excited about building um, a new piece of tooling or infrastructure or, or project within the space that's going to benefit the, the wider community and network, um, that's a great place as well to um, go and, and identify ways that you can help push things forward and also uh, get uh, you know, funding to spend your time that way. Awesome. This was a really fantastic talk. Uh, I'm really sorry the chat broke. It's no. working again now, though. Um, but thanks so much. Uh, we're going to transition to our next session. Awesome. Thank you so much for the great questions. And hope everyone has a great rest of the conference.